Good morning. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. When it comes to medical devices, we have an insane policy that makes no sense. Devices that have been recalled because they severely injured patients are used again and again as models for new devices. It's not a surprise that the new devices also seriously injure patients. This is wrong, just plain wrong. If an automobile is recalled for a major safety problem, we wouldn't allow future models to repeat this same flaw. The same should be true for the medical devices used in our bodies. If the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, knows that a certain product is defective, it seems reasonable enough that they should be able to reject it. But there's a loophole in our current law that actually requires FDA to approve certain kinds of medical devices, even if they have reason to believe that it may harm or even kill patients. That's because most devices are cleared by FDA under what's known as the 510K process, named after its section in the federal law. Under 510K, FDA reviews new devices and is required to clear them as long as the device is similar to a product that is already for sale. The 510K process should really be called 510-PREY process because FDA can't protect you. So you better start hoping and praying that it won't cause serious harm. Holes in the medical device approval process are leading to holes in patients' hearts, bladders, and other internal organs, causing grave injuries and even death. This must be corrected. The fact that medical devices that are put into patients' bodies don't have to show they are safe or effective would shock a lot of people. When a patient gets wheeled into surgery, she assumes that the medical device the surgeon will use is safe and effective. After all, that's what FDA's stamp of approval means, right? But what few realize is that the device implanted in them to help them walk or breathe, or their heart to beat, was likely cleared through the 510K process and wasn't required to show it is safe. In fact, it's probably not been tested in humans at all. As long as the device company shows its product is similar to an earlier version, the company has the green light to sell their product to doctors and patients. But what happens when the device is modeled after an earlier one that has seriously injured or even killed patients? What happens is that earlier model harmed so many people that it had to be recalled? Would FDA still clear the new device? Under current law, the FDA has no choice. Most people would agree that they wouldn't want a new medical device that was modeled off a defective model. That's just common sense. But this can happen under current law. Tragically, it does happen. And patients have been killed and grievous, grievously injured as a result. If the government determines that a tainted chemical is being used in 10 different prescription, prescription drugs, it would pull every single one of those drugs from the shelf. And it would ensure that the tainted chemical was never again used in another product. Medical devices are treated differently. If a faulty product is recalled, the recalled device can indefinitely be used as a valid model to approve new devices. And this has devastated lives. You'll hear today, and you can read in my report, Defective Devices Destroyed Lives, about how this entire process works. This is the actual reality of how ordinary Americans are treated uh, in the device sector, uh, and we are going to make this available uh, to the public uh, beginning 
uh, today. It is a devastating uh, indictment of the ongoing uh, calamity that is this entire area. Parents who were once able to support their families are permanently disabled and living in pain because they have received these defective medical devices. Hardworking Americans have had their life savings swallowed up by medical bills they racked up trying to undo the damage from a defective device, and the emotional stress is beyond calculation. Dr. Tom Margolis, a pelvic surgeon from California, has witnessed this firsthand. He was planning on joining us uh, this morning, uh, but his connecting flight has been canceled because of the fog. He took a red-eye flight across the country because, as he wrote, I want to be a voice for the scores of women I've treated over the last decade who have suffered devastating injuries from a flawed device that should never have been allowed on the market. He has performed scores of what he calls salvage surgeries on women with bleeding, pain, and permanent injury to their bladder, bowel, and nerves. Dr. Margolis rebuts the argument made by MeSH proponents who argue that complications occur because inadequately trained surgeons perform the procedures incorrectly. The bottom line, he wrote, is that mesh devices always have been and always will be a defective product no matter who puts them in. Further, he writes, from a surgeon's perspective, all this is made additionally tragic by the fact that there are several superior options to the use of synthetic mesh for incontinence and prolapse surgery, one of which are plagued by the uh, complication to mesh. That the FDA does not have the ability to reject new devices based on the current flawed model unconscionable. Though I personally abhor big government, I believe it should intervene when it's indicated. In this case, it's indicated. I hope that Congress will work together to save future patients from a fate that has caused too much suffering and too many women to date. That is my hope as well. My mother always told me that two wrongs don't make a right. In this case, companies shouldn't be able to win FDA clearance for a device that mimics the same flaws in its earlier model. That's why I introduced legislation that would untie FDA's hands and give them the authority to reject a, re a device that is based on a product recalled for a major safety flaw. The Sound Devices Act closes a major loophole in the current device approval process. I will fight to include this bill in the FDA legislation that Congress will consider this summer as a part of the Medical Device User Fee Act so that patients will never have to experience what Jay <coughs> and the thousands of others like her have already endured. Now, I welcome Jay, mother of three from Colorado, who lives in constant pain because of, uh, caused by, uh, uh, as a result of a mesh implant she received four years ago. Jay used to work as a truck driver in Colorado, where she enjoyed playing the drums with a rock band. She underwent several painful surgeries to correct damage from the mesh, and I thank her for making the trip to speak out about her experience. Jay? Thank you. Good morning. I don't know why I was chosen out of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands, affected by a product that never should have been allowed back into the marketplace. I'm not as bad off as some. Those would be the ones who have died as a direct result of a product that had no business being in their bodies. I'm also not as bad off as the ones who have had repeated operations, three, five, seven, and more, to try to remove the toxic waste that is crippling them. I am, however, not in a happy place, and I'm not alone. 
The dates, doctors, and procedures may be different, but the outcome is similar. Our doctors recommended a procedure involving a device that, unknown to any of us, was cleared for sale based on a predicate device which had been recalled. The results? Erosion, where the mesh cuts through your organs, such as your bladder. Pain, continued incontinence, prolapse, new hernias, repeat infections, bleeding, blood clots, autoimmune issues, and in the worst cases, death, just like the original. In April of 2008, I was diagnosed with stress urinary incontinence. This is not something that those of us who have it are likely to talk about in public or even among friends. It is a highly private issue. Maybe the reason I was asked to be here is because I am willing to talk about it. Backtracking just a bit, in March of 2008, it was suggested that a total hysterectomy would relieve the monthly pain and female problems I was having. The gynecologist and I had a very lengthy discussion about the pros and cons of such an intrusive procedure. At the end of this discussion, I mentioned that I leaked urine when I moved too fast, sneezed or coughed, and asked if there was anything they could do about it. Of course, I was told. I was sent for urodynamic testing on Friday, April 4th. At the time, I was told I was a perfect candidate for this wonderful 30-minute procedure and never would I leak again. Then I was handed a brochure of this wonderful product with a cartoon illustration of how it's placed. It didn't strike me as being very comfortable looking, but if the FDA approved it, as it showed on the brochure, and the doctor strongly suggested it must be okay, right? At no time during the urodynamic testing visit or the following Monday with the gynecologist was I told this was a permanent device. No one told me there was no testing of this product prior to its clearance by the FDA. No one mentioned the predicate device, of which this one was substantially equivalent, had failed. I didn't know to ask any of those questions. On April 8th, four days after the testing, when I awoke after four and a half hours or four plus hours of surgery, almost two hours of which was spent putting in this TVTO mesh device, I felt a pain unlike anything I'd ever felt before. When I tried to adjust myself to a more comfortable position, a saw blade, what felt like a saw blade, sliced across my feminine parts. My tailbone was burning. The top of my thighs and groin ached. I was sent home like this the next day. Two weeks later, after many tearful phone calls and numerous painful visits to the gynecologist, I was in worse shape. I couldn't sit, stand, or walk without agonizing, burning, tearing pain in my pelvic and groin areas. I couldn't sleep. I took drugs to help ease the pain, but they made me sick. I cried. I begged for help from the doctor who installed this torture device. I was told she'd never seen a problem before. I was told it had to be mental. Since this was an elective procedure, I was told to learn to live with it. I had a second operation on May 2nd to remove the center section of the mesh that had eroded, leaving the arms of the sling embedded in my nerves. This eased the sawing pain, but the burning and tearing feeling continued. Over the next three plus years, I would see more doctors than I had over my entire lifetime to try and get relief. I lost my job as a truck driver because I couldn't sit. I lost my health insurance. I couldn't pay my bills and the creditors began to howl. My house payments fell behind and a deep depression settled in. This past Saturday, I received a letter from the bank. They are starting foreclosure. Since April 8th of 2008, I have lost not only my job and insurance, but good credit, independence, quality of life, and now my home. I used to be a tax-paying, productive member of society. Now I need a cane or a walker to get around. 
just going to the bathroom can be a very painful experience. Since the placement of the TVTO mesh, I have developed high blood pressure, fibromyalgia, and nerve damage. I'm now receiving Medicare and disability at tax, taxpayers' expense. And I'm not alone. What exactly is the purpose of the FDA if not to ensure that the public is kept safe from harm? The FDA does not have the power to keep the public safe under the current 510K process, where substantially equivalent devices enter the marketplace based on a predicate device recalled for safety issues. Nothing can change what happened to me, but supporting the SOUND Act will give the FDA the power to protect others in the future. Many thanks to Congressman Markey and others supporting the bill introducing this important medical device safety legislation. Thank you. What a heroine uh, Jay is. Can we hear her for Jay? Huh? Is, 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 isn't she great for coming out here and standing up and telling her story? But it's the story of hundreds of thousands of people. That's the sad part of it. We could fill this entire mall with people coming here and just standing here and telling their stories. And Jay is, you know, just a heroine uh, for being here and willing to be the one that's here and telling her story. Cynthia Pearson is the executive director of the National Women's Health Network. Uh, and this is an organization dedicated to promoting women's health and supporting consumer decision making. Cynthia has led the charge at the network to raise awareness about the troubled 510K process. Cynthia, we thank you for You're being welcome. here with us. Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Markey and your colleagues for introducing this act, the Sound Medical Devices Act, and for championing change that will make a real difference in the life of millions. As you and Jay have both said, Jay's far from the only woman harmed by defective surgical mesh. However, in addition to the many people harmed by that one device, there are so many other devices that have come onto the market through the same flawed 510K procedure. The Sound Devices Act will protect women like Jay who need surgical mesh in the future. And it will also protect millions more women who may need a medical device like a hip replacement, a heart stent, or a fertility evaluation tool that treats a different kind of health problem. It will help these millions of women by making it possible for the Food and Drug Administration to keep more unsafe devices off the market and out of women's bodies. As an organization that often finds it necessary to call on the FDA to do more, we are pleased today that women are unified with the FDA in support of the common sense proposals in this bill. We and the FDA agree that it makes sense to allow the agency to require more information about a device before that device is allowed on the market. It makes sense for the FDA to be able to reject a device application if that application is based on a product that was recalled or is in the process of being removed because of major safety problems. These legislative changes will make it possible for the FDA to protect patients and consumers from devices that should never have been on the market in the first place. The National Women's Health Network urges Congress to stand up for women's health and pass the Sound Devices Act. And we and our colleagues concerned about consumer health and safety will mobilize many more people who have not yet been touched by a defective device, but who care and who will send you their messages of support. 
because like both of you have said, women need to know that where, when they're in a doctor's office and they see something that says FDA approved, that it means the FDA had the power to ensure that devices implanted in our bodies are safe and effective. That's the future we're working for, and we hope we make it this year with your help. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, uh, beautiful. Thank you.